Brilliant. Yeah. So we're now recording. We're up and running and people are sort of um, filtering, filtering into the room. Um, as, as you guys do, feel free to uh, say a quick hello in the chat, the chat room. Uh, let us know where you're joining from. Um, Matt, where are you? Where are you in the world? I'm in North London. So, um, yeah, it's, it's cloudy. It looks like it's probably going to rain. So it's the most typical North London day you could imagine. Good. Good. And Becky, where, where are you joining from? I'm in Buckinghamshire, beautiful Buckinghamshire, and I'm wearing my woolly polar bear jumper because summer is not here. It's nice. Here. I was wearing like a nice summery top and I was like, no, it's freezing. Back to the jumpers, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, I did. A I... Bit, bit depressing, that, isn't it? We've got, got someone yeah. joining us from Greystones in Ireland. That's, uh, there you go, international audience. Good to, oh, good to know. The weather, the weather in Ireland was good yesterday, so I hope it's, I hope it's still sunny there today. <laughs> um, absolutely. Well, I also think to mark it, always good to, to mark a recorded webinar in time. So um, obviously, oh, gorgeous weather in Ireland. We're all in the wrong place. Um, but obviously, exciting football result yesterday. So I feel Woo! we should celebrate that. Uh, <laughs> I, I did, pizza. Felix. I did have my. Sh I had an England shirt on about five minutes ago when I called Becky. But I thought I, people might think I'm a hooligan if I keep it on. So I have got changed specifically <laughs> for this webinar. Fair enough. Well, we'll just we'll remember remember you're patriotic today. Then, then Matt. <laughs> <laughs> that's all good. Um, cool. Well, that's enough chit chat. Um, <laughs> welcome everyone to first webinar, uh, sorry, first webinar, last webinar of Q, Q2, would have been the first of Q3 if it was tomorrow, but it's, uh, it's not. Really exciting one and massive thanks to both Becky and Matt for joining us today. Uh, we're going to be talking about what's next in HR tech um, and of course topic that's increasingly important uh, given all of the changes we've had to undergo under the last 18 months, but I'm sure that both of them will tell, tell you that it was important even before we, uh, uh, we realized that uh, it was urgent um, during, the, uh, during the pandemic. So look, the webinar today shouldn't last any more than an hour. We're gonna send through uh, this recording um, afterwards. Uh, just the last thing to say before we um, dive into introducing Becky and Matt is we're gonna send out a feedback form later on today please do fill it out it's so helpful for us to uh, guide the topics that we do webinars and content on in the future but then also uh, improve as as we go so as i mentioned welcoming two absolutely amazing guest speakers today we've got becky who is um, a principal um, in hr and technology um, transformation over at varan performance um, has been advising businesses um, and hr directors for past seven years around what technology will deliver the biggest benefits um, and that's everything from recruitment to robotic process um, automation all the way through to retirement and I believe Becky you've recently completed some research into how AI has been used in HR um, as well as sort of further study on how best to measure the effectiveness of HR and then we've got Matt who is the co-founder of the happiness index and head of global happiness. Not a job title I've heard before, but maybe one we'll be hearing more of in the future. Um, happiness Index, as Matt will tell you, I'm sure, um, provides employee engagement surveys and solutions to help businesses to identify focus areas, boost retention, and create a happier wo workforce. So um, that combines neuroscience, academic research, and over 10 million customer data points that they uh, to ensure they fully understand the global global drivers behind happiness and engagement. Um, so that is the end of uh, me reading out LinkedIn bios, um, <laughs> <laughs> jumping straight in um, to, um, uh, to questions. Really want it to be an interactive and engaging session today. So um, I've got some questions I want to ask, but please, please do use the Q&A box um, that we've got if you've got questions for either Becky or Matt or me or all three um, and uh, and I say we uh, we should get get started so I'm gonna lead us off with a really really broad question to both of you guys um, I, I don't think that people traditionally think of HR as the world's most tech enabled function the the ones that really push technology within an organization I, I do think that's changing, but in your guys' opinion, um, how important is technology to the success of an HR function? And Becky, can we start with you? Yeah, so what I was trying to think about um, 
HR functions without technology that work well. So I was thinking there must be some, right? Because HR arguably is about people and well-being, you know, looking after people, making sure people are in the right jobs. Do you have to have technology to do that? Um, I think in a really small organization, potentially not. Um, and I guess in an organization where you know everyone really well, um, you can probably actually get away with it. Um, but we're working with an organization at the moment in the tech space who um, that does not apply to. So they're a big global organization and they are losing their talent left, right and center to competitors who offer them better learning opportunities, bigger salaries, you know, different benefits, flexible working arrangements. And at the moment, that organization, because they don't have a single HR system and set of data for all of their people, they don't know who their talent are, where they sit, what skills they have, what they care about, what they want, what they're paid. So um, for me, the technology itself is not that critical, but actually the data on your people and the visibility that it allows you to have is really important, um, unless you're a really small organization where you know everyone and you know that stuff without having to have it recorded. Matt, what do you think? Um, I'll sort of add a bit of, yeah, a sort of bit of research to back up Becky's point and also personal experience, which is, so I'm an entrepreneur and I'm building my second business. And there's a, there's some people might be familiar with the Dunbar number. So the Dunbar number, for those that don't know, is how many relationships that we can all hold. Um, and it, 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 at its core, you have like a really core group of people, like it might be your brothers, sisters and closest friends. That, that ultimate amount is about 100, between 100 and 120 that we can kind of like as human beings, those relationships that we can hold and they can be good relationships. But if you think if you're in a company of 100 employees, once you get to that point, you get to the point where you don't actually know everyone's names and so on and so on. So I do, I do think it's a, I do think it's a scale thing, but I do think um, it, it's, it's, it's needed to help, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't be the be or, or end all. And I say this as someone who sells technology, like it's there, it's there to help and enable, but if technology is the answer, then you've asked the wrong question. I'm not saying you asked the wrong question, Felix, but it should be there to, it should be there to help. Um, and we, we should be asking the bigger questions around how do we make this a place where our employees can thrive and so on and so on. And then if technology can help that, then that's great. But, um, we, we don't want to start with the technology as the answer. Otherwise, technology will always be the answer. Yeah. And Matt, with a risk of um, sounding, which is absolutely not what I'm trying to do, but um, a risk of sounding like I'm plucking what, what you guys do. Um, with, with a sort of example of like happiness, for example, um, yeah. I definitely would not associate that with um, a data-driven tech solution. So yeah. how how does a, a, a but i would maybe associate it with the slightly more um intangible relationship driven elements that you'd expect that you traditionally expect from an hr function so why is it that you guys are taking a, a tech driven solution to a um i suppose a feeling yeah i, th I think I'll, I'll, I'll blame thomas the tank engine for this <laughs> i think most people's first introduction into the world of work is watching Thomas the Tank Engine. And there's a character that is not known as the fat controller anymore, but that's, that's what it was known when, when most of us grew up. And most people have this like view and, you, and we all do it to our children and, and friends accidentally of this work is this place where you have to go and you kind of, kind of do it. And it's a thing you have to do to get money and so on and so on. Um, so when you talk about happiness, people think that that's something that might happen in your personal life. Uh, by accident if you get married or, or whatever but in reality the research behind it shows that people who are happier at work perform better now the problem is the the term employee engagement was coined by William Kahn in 1990 um, and that it was all supposed always supposed to include happiness in there but there's this business term called if you can measure it you can manage it you've probably probably all heard of it I think it was by a drucker or someone but I think that's part of the problem. And it goes back to that Thomas the Tank Engine view of the world. Um, that I think that that term needs to evolve, which is um, if you can measure it, you can understand it. So you're not using, you shouldn't be using technology to measure, to control people um, as the controller would. 
you it's to understand and help people and i think that's where a lot of technology gets mixed up and that's where you see all these questions around surveillance where people are using platforms to like measure how long people are at their laptop and all this kind of stuff and again it's just it's about understanding how your workforce feel so you can create a better environment so they can perform better um and the the, the thing that i always say so we do measure engagement it's if you imagine two people going to the pub, which is what we used to be able to do, they will never talk about um, engagement and so on down the pub. They just talk about whether they're happy. And, that, and that's the human side of it. So it's, it's moving on from ignoring the fact that we have these emotions and trying to bring them into work and make that, make that normal. I don't know if that answers your question, Felix. Yeah, I, th I mean, I, I think it does, right? It's um, taking a, a your objective being happiness yes. uh, as opposed to keeping people in the organization happy people perform uh, and then also remain within an organization it's using data to inform the, the levers that that help them get there uh, I, I, I think anyway um becky you is that something that is that sort of i suppose misconception around uh, collecting data to better control things as opposed to um, what Matt was speaking about before is that something that you see with with your clients sometimes and how they're uh, using technology and, and data um is it something that I see <clears throat> I think the um I think the issue that that we see more is um is almost like a fear because if you collect the data you you have to do something about it um so I think that I think that's one of the things that stops some of the organizations that are a bit behind from using things like employee voice and employee engagement surveys, because they know that if they open the floodgates, right, if they allow people to tell them how they feel, they then have to do something about it. Um, so I think that, I think that's probably more, more the worry. Um, but what's been really good for, um, for Varan, so we actually use um, the happiness index tool ourselves. What's been really useful is um, we've started to, um, to to remind people every Wednesday to add their feedback. And what we what we've been doing over the last few months, more so than when we first got the tool, was to ask people to add um, comments every Wednesday or every week, regardless of how they feel. Because I think what can happen is you, a bit like TripAdvisor, you add comments or reviews when you're feeling particularly bad, right? It's been a really stressful week or the workload's been really awful. You've had some bad feedback. I think people are more inclined, maybe it's a British thing, I don't know, to add feedback in those instances rather than when you're feeling okay or pretty good. You know, there's not much to report. And, and actually people are saying, oh, I quite like adding it every week because then I can see my happiness, my fluctuations over time. And actually it becomes more acceptable to me as a person and to the organization that my happiness might go from one to 10 in like an hour or a day or a week. Um, and that's, that's been really helpful for us. And it normalizes those fluctuations rather than thinking that people have to have this permanent state of happiness or engagement. Felix, can we just geek out on that point for a little bit there? <laughs> yeah. Just a little bit, which is what, what Becky's describing there is natural human behavior that's fed, fed by dopamine effectively. And I learned this, I learned this from the book, um, have you, did you remember the book why, uh, I can't remember exactly which way around is, why men are from Venus and women are from Mars? There's, there's a bit about the, the differences um, in that book. And one of the things that, that's fascinating about it is, you know when Becky's saying like, we get data and we want to do something about it. What, one of the things that dri is driving that in all of us is dopamine. It's like the reward thing that if we get something and we do something, we, we need to keep doing something with it. But what's fascinating about that is that in all of us, it drives the wrong behavior when actually sometimes people just want you to listen. Um, and I've made that mistake in, in so many of my relationships at work and home and whatever, which someone tells me something about how they feel. And my natural tendency is I want to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when actually it's sometimes just collecting data about how they feel, that's, that, that, that's part of it. It's just showing that you care. You do need to move on to actually fix big trends and so on and so on. But the first stage is actually sh listening to people shows that you care. So just wanted to geek out on a bit of bit, bit, bit of chemistry stuff there, Felix, if that's okay. <laughs> Absolutely, I think, it's, I, think, I think it's really important. It's something that I noticed that we get lost in both in terms of as HR professionals looking at trends within organizations and as I guess technologists full stop. 
Um, I think sometimes you can get lost in the data and forget that it comes, a lot of the things that we're looking, that we're talking about come from you know, human nature, from, uh, from the biology and the chemistry behind, um, behind everything. So I think it's really, it's great to pull it back to, you know, who we are as people and where we look for. And I think it's this sort of ties into that sort of search for purpose, which is why, you know, it's what you do in your job and how happy you are in your job is one of the key drivers to our individual purposes as um as employees but also then as family members and friends and and all the rest of it so it's i think it's really interesting that it, how how interlinked it, it becomes um becky i was wondering I, I think one of the things that I, I think a lot of people in our network of hr directors hr managers struggle with when it comes to thinking about a new technology is there are so many out there for such specific seemingly such specific uh, parts of 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 the world so it might be you know employee engagement or or, or happiness like uh, man happiness index you know it could be um, anything from your applicant tracking system to your hris all the rest of it mm -hmm. how how would how do you think that hr directors maybe early on that process maybe they've got one hris system or something like that in place or something like that how what are the first things that they should look at when putting something to together for the business um good question so um you're right there are literally hundreds um my recommendation to people on the call is not to go to kensington olympia to the hr software show once a year because it is so stressful first of all it's about 30 degrees um at all times <laughs> but there are literally thousands of stands um and I think what happens when you go to a software show like that is exactly what Matt said earlier, which is that you see the software and you love the look of it. And then you try and fit it into your business somewhere. You're like, right, that's really cool. Where can we slot it in? Where can we kind of wedge it into our existing landscape? And, you know, which population can we, can we put that into? Because we like the look of it. And we get this question a lot with um, robotic process automation with chatbots. People come to us and say, where could we use automation? Or where could we put a chatbot? Um, and I think that HR directors are getting better at um, not worrying about the technology first and thinking about what the business problem is. Um, so, you know, really what, what business problems can you not solve without better data and technology or which business objectives can you not achieve without better data and technology? And you go from there. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of one, one point. And the other, I think, is to think really on, really early on, about um, whether you're looking at what we would call tier one systems. So this is like your Workday, Success Factors, Oracle, big enterprise systems with thousands of global customers. Um, they come with their pros and cons, right? They're very functionally rich. Um, they're also very expensive. They're probably not gonna be bought or acquired or taken over, they're, they're there for the long run and they lead the way. Um, or are you looking for you know, what we would call a tier two solution? which is probably more um, specific to a certain area, um, more cost-effective, more agile. They're probably going to be more reactive and actually take better care of you potentially as a customer being a small business. Um, it's quite difficult to run competitions or comparisons with both in them because you can't compare like for like. Um, so you end up choosing the cheapest because it's just too confusing um, to compare them. So that's probably a good place to start. Fantastic. That's really helpful. And once you've cho chosen your, you know, your tier two, tier one, tier two solution or something like that, I think the, the next stage is often getting business buy-in for, for a system transformation. Um, I think we've, we've all, we've all been on the receiving end of this is your new software. This is what you're using now. This is, this is how we're going to live our, uh, live our life. Have you got any good tips for, for getting employee buy-in to um, new, new systems? Yeah, it's a good one. I'd love to know, um, are people able to put their hands up or anything in this? Can they do that on Zoom webinar? Should should be able to. It'd be good to, to know or from the chat, you know, if, if people are going through this at the moment. So if people have good or bad experiences of getting buy-in um, for systems. I think um, it's good to be really upfront about whether you're getting buy-in for a system that is going to replace another system or that's going to do a technical job or if you're trying to transform the business in some way. 
Um, sometimes organizations think that they want to do a transformation, but they don't really. They don't really want to change their processes and their behaviors, how they do things. They do just want a new piece of kit. Um, so it's good to be quite upfront about that because the kinds of people and the kinds of money um, that you need to put together are, are different. Um, and the other, the other experience we've got is um, we've been doing this process for the whole time that brand's been up and running, right? So let's say eight years where we test the business case. So this is the cost of the new system or the new program. These are the benefits, these are the risks, this is how we're gonna govern it. And we take that round, um, all of the people that need to give buy-in, that need to give approval, many times until they're literally so bored of seeing that pack that they're like, okay, have the system, just go, just get on with it. Um, and we're working with this Japanese client and there's actually a name for it in Japan. Um, so they call it uh, Ringi Show. So Ringi Show is a, a management process in Japan where someone with an idea will go around all of their managers, all of their peers, and they'll get comments. And people literally put a bit of paper this way up if they approve or this way up if they don't approve. Um, and so little did we know we've been doing this process all along. Um, but it's all about gaining consensus, you know, gaining buy-in. And that's not a presentation and a yes or no it's a process that probably has to happen two or three times, you know, to get everyone's questions, everyone's concerns. Um, so little did we know we've been doing Ringy Show for the last eight years and it works really well. Nice. Um, fantastic. And I think just adding in from um, one of the um, audience, they, uh, Mark says that they, 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 the way that they go about it is using digital champions around the, um, around the business and provide them with information on the new systems and, um, and uh, get them to, I guess, um, sounds like to, to implement pilot and then come back with questions um, and, and see how they interpret the benefits as well, which I think is a really good idea, Mark. Thanks for. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and outcomes, right? So I, I mentioned a little bit about business case and I like to take some credit for Matt's book, which is about the business case for happiness, because we had a conversation a few years ago um, and Matt was saying, you know, how do you how do you as a consultancy, um, because consultancy is not always considered a needed thing um, by businesses, you know, how do you get that first bit of work? And I said, well, we tend to do a business case. So we help them to write a business case on the HR transformation or the HR technology program to weigh up costs and benefits. And we do that iteratively with all the stakeholders. So, um, so I think it, you know, it is all about the business outcomes, the business benefits that you would get. And that can be quite a long exercise because HR, um, love HR to bits, we work with them all the time, but quite often HR are thinking about it from a HR perspective. So they're thinking, you know, we can get rid of all of that manual work, no more checking, we can do more valuable work, you know, we can have better interactions with our, our colleagues and our employees, we can spend less time doing, you know, classroom training and we can make it all online um, and it needs to be flipped really to look at it from the business point of view um, to get that buy in. I think Felix just to add to Becky's point, and yeah, I did steal the business case from you just to confirm that live. But um, my um, my actual background before working for HR professionals was marketing professionals, and if I had to compare the two industries in terms of digital transformation, um, and I don't mean this in a negative way, I would say marketing is about ten years ahead in the ways in the way it uses technology. Um, so what I would encourage as many companies as you can, and HR are way ahead in understanding people. So I think it's a, it's a balanced thing, but I would encourage HR teams to work closely with their marketing team. And in some companies I've seen it merged and the, the, the visualization I've put into everyone's head that we use is to see um, if you imagine a tree with its roots. So the culture is the roots and the, and the leaves are the brand, because if you can get all those pieces to work together, then actually everyone everyone is benefiting from each other's skills. So I think exactly what Becky's saying, building that by bringing them different teams together, you're, you're ultimately you're building that business case for brand beyond the culture piece. So I definitely encourage you to um, have some sessions with your marketing team. That's really, and are there, are there, are there, any, um, are there any particular skill sets within marketing or, or things that mar marketeers do that you think HR should be learning from to just to guide that conversation? I think I think it's now joining. The reason I got into employee happiness because I started with customer happiness and I was tracking the data back and I suddenly realized like, the obvious case was, would be a cafe, wouldn't it? That if the, if you treat the employees of the cafe well, then when you come in, you the, the waiter or waitress or whoever it is treats you well and then you become loyal and come back. But marketers call that customer experience. 
And now we're seeing it, it more talked about in employee experience. Um, but marketers have been on that journey of customer experience for uh, for a long period of time. So I think once you stop thinking about it as employee and customer, and you actually just start thinking about it as experience, um, then it starts to change the way that you look. And then suddenly people start to question. Um, and this is quite this is quite a big change for some people. Then people start to question, oh, should we rename? Should we actually move away from HR and marketing and call it something else? Which I don't want to get into that. Should HR be called something else? Conversation will be here all day. Um, but it's but ultimately it's about getting those those two big influential teams to work closer on experience. That's really interesting. And Be- Becky, what do you see? Um, do you see that um, in the numbers and the business cases that you create that the, there's actually a, a sort of a bottom line impact on um, the way that the employee experience should, should we call it? Um, as well as a customer yeah absolutely yeah we, we do um you know a really good um a really good example is around uh employee turnover employee churn people leaving so if you actually look at the cost of people leaving you know by looking at their direct recruitment costs the time it takes to get them productive you know training costs onboarding costs etc if you look at how much it costs businesses to lose people even if you can keep people for an extra three months or something, sometimes it's hundreds of thousands or millions of pounds. You know, if you can keep one person um, and prevent them from going to a competitor, that, that can really add a lot to the bottom line. Um, and then there's something else that really stuck to me um, when I went to one of our financial services, HR and compliance events that Zoe, who's on the line, runs. We run it at a Metro Bank. Um, Metro Bank are really interesting. They've got these lovely values. You know, they're very different to a normal financial services organisation. Um, and they've got their values all over the place. And like their rooms are named after it. It's in there. You know, it's, it's everywhere. And one of their um, one of their values is to surprise and delight. And I think it started as a we should surprise and delight our customers. And I think that they're now bringing that into um, everyone. We should surprise and delight our employees as well, because quite a lot of organizations have these values like that that are really tailored for the customer and why not make them for employees as well i like that which is surprising yeah. tonight <laughs> i couldn't couldn't agree with the surprising with the like all, all that point um more so i think it would be an odd webinar or chat at this time of the world if we didn't if we didn't talk about how things have changed um post pandemic and how we in, expect them to what elements we think are going to be retained and which ones we think are going to go back to how they were um before but uh, becky maybe if i start with if i start with you what pressures have uh, remote working and lockdown had on um hr and, and why has and and how has that impacted how they people think about technology and um some of the things that you guys deal with well, 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 I might actually throw this to Matt because, um, okay, because not not to avoid the question, but because my experience is anecdotal and Matt's got some lovely data um, that, that backs this up. So um, Matt will tell you all about how miserable HR people can be, um, not on purpose, but just if you look at the data, HR people absorb, I think, naturally so much of other people's feelings. Um, And we definitely see this, right? People go into HR because they love people, they care about people, um, they like those interactions. You know, the business cases that we put together are based on people getting away from screens and spreadsheets to spend more time with people. So naturally, I think this crisis has been really hard on the HR population. Um, I think it's almost a little bit like teaching where it's so much responsibility for how other people feel. And if people are spending eight, 10, 12 hours at work, I think HR feels quite a lot of responsibility for making sure that that is good. And then with the pandemic, you've got this added responsibility of keeping people safe and well, like physically, um, which is not something that HR are trained to do. Um, you know, we were talking with Leanne Gardner, who's the HR director of In Health, um, on our webinar last week. And she was saying that actually what drove innovation and agility and pace during the crisis was the need to keep people safe. So that's quite a different mission to what HR had before the pandemic. Great. Well, what do you think, Matt? Now it's been thrown thrown back over to you. Yeah. So um, thanks, Becky. The, um, the the research that Becky's talking about here is our long-standing research that sadly 
the HR HR professionals are unhappier than most other professionals uh, as a profession when we look at broadly at everyone from marketers and salespeople and so on and so on. The the and and just so everyone knows, the pandemic hasn't been equal for everyone. Okay, so um, engineers, which is a lot of my employee uh, base, have actually become happier generally because they engineers generally don't like open plan offices where people meet like me go around asking them how happy they are. And um, so what what we're seeing with HR professionals, the, the, the question, and as Becky said, it's not their fault, but the question is why are HR professionals unhappier? So there's, everyone has drivers of happiness and it changes uh, based on broad trends. But with HR professionals, the first driver of happiness is impact. And the second one is relationships. So the reality, Becky's right. Most people get, most people who get into HR are nice people. And I guess a broad broad statement but most people get into HR because they want to actually help people and and if a HR professional doesn't feel that their work it has impact their happiness slides drastically and the second bit is relationships and we all know that relationships have been harder um, in the world that, that we've gone into so um, I think the first thing that, that, that I, I didn't really know about counseling but I found out that if you if you're a, if you're a trained counselor, um, you have to have a, you have to be counselled yourself. Mm. So I think what we need to do um, as a HR industry and wider business industry is I think we need to understand the load that HR professionals take on, um, and we need to support them because if you think about it, whether it's redundancies, mergers and acquisitions, uh, businesses like ours and Varan that are scaling and adding new staff you can be taking on a lot of emotional information and you've got companies like the happiness index saying you should take on more emotional information. This has a load on you. This has a load on your own well-being, And, and, and if they're the people that are taking that on, we need to support HR professionals better. So just to, just to break out the difference between well-being and happiness, I believe personally from our data, well-being is the foundation of everything, right? The performance of everything. Happiness is just an emotion that tells you how healthy the business is and it's one thing that we look at so i think the conversation we're having here felix is how do we make sh- how do we make sure we're looking after the well-being of hr professionals so they can look ast- after everyone else and the analogy that i would leave you with is that when you're on an airplane if we ever get to go on one again is um w- when you know when you get on and they say if when if the plane's going down or whatever put on your mask before the person next to you and I think that's that. That is the wider debate here: is how do we uh, how do we look after HR people so they can support others? Yeah, yeah, that completely makes sense. And broader, speaking of the supporting others, then um, from what you're seeing, what you've seen in the in the data, what impact has the? And this is a pretty broad brushstroke, but what have been the trends in changes to to workplace culture uh, over the last sort of year and a half? So, so the first, just get the broad scale data out. Everyone has become unhappier generally as a broad scale, apart from engineers, really. Um, so you have to acknowledge that. Um, but it is bouncing back, and people are incredibly resilient. Um, the one thing that I think we need to take from the data, so something that we've seen is called an emotional deficit. Employees have wanted to communicate times three, times four than they would have normally done with their companies. Um, as a leader, when you're under stress, you tend to go into either fight or flight. So at a period where employees have wanted to communicate more, leaders have been scared about communicating because they haven't, they, haven't, they haven't known what to say. Um, so my broad stroke piece of advice from the data is that your employees can handle um, you saying that you don't know. What they can't handle is being ignored. So you have to acknowledge that your employees want to communicate emotionally with you three to four times because they're stressed with what's going on in the world. Um, and as leaders, we need to work out how that we're going to communicate back and forth. And what we see where we look, we've got about 100 clients. The clients that score the highest in these areas that if I go from our client base is leaders who regularly stand up and communicate. This is what you've said. This is what we can do about it. But fundamentally, this is what we can't do about it. Like if you've got like a 30, if you're a canary a business in Canary Wharf and you've got a 35 year lease, you're under extreme pressure to change that from your employees because they might want a more flexible environment. But your, your, your employees will understand if you, if you present those financial facts to them. If you stand up and say, I'm the CEO, it's going to cost us 30 million to get out of this contract. 
So what we're going to try and do is balance things up like this and this. It might not be what people want to hear, but at least you're, unless you're breaking labour laws, everyone that you're employing is an adult um, and they would prefer the truth um, than trying to shield them. I was wondering where you were going to go with the breaking labour laws. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just a simple reminder for everyone, isn't it? Like everyone you employ is an adult and they all manage their own personal profit and loss accounts called their mortgages and rents. So if you explain it to people, they will get it. You don't You don't ha throw away the umbrella is what I say, the old management technique of holding the umbrella up to protect everyone. Let, let people see what's going on and, and treat them like adults. Can I add a couple of things, Felix? So I wanted to add um, something practical on Matt's last point about looking after HR so they can look after the business. Um, again, without without plugging um, any, because I think all three of us have got networks for HR people, um, normally face-to-face -face events. So normally um, we all, I think, run face-to-face -face events for HR people, free networking events, drinks, crisps, beer, you know, all that kind of nice stuff, some speakers. Um, things like that, I think, are that's like a practical way that you can support HR people because then they get to um, network with other HR professionals, especially in the smaller organisations where there's less of a community of HR people. And we find that that really builds resilience. People come away like buzzing and with a few new HR friends. So I think that's a really practical thing that we need to um, bring back and also do in a, in a hybrid or safe way. Um, and the other stuff was... Um, we have been doing some stay surveys. So um, stay surveys I heard of when I was doing some research in the legal sector from uh, Beverly Sorsby. She's a HR director at Ropes and Gray Law Firm. And she said that the new trend is to not just do exit surveys when people have already left or resigned, but stay surveys with people that have been around for say two years and you ask them what they like and what they don't like and what they're struggling with. And, um, you know, and you try and preempt issues that would make people leave before it's too late. And I love that. I was like, we absolutely have to do that. That would be really fascinating. So I've done about 10 of those now in our organisation. And um, the top thing that comes up that people love the most about Varan are these two weekly company wide calls that um, myself and one of the founding directors run. And we started them during lockdown because it was really we were in survival mode at that point. So we had a load of people on furlough. Um, we had a load of clients that couldn't pay us overnight and so these calls <clears throat> were in the beginning about survival and how our you know how our health was doing right so it was like you know we, we um, don't have that product anymore so you know I'm really sorry but you guys are going to have to stay on further a bit longer um, you know this one's looking pretty hopeful we're giving it like a 40% chance and if we can do that then we can get three people back it was you know really like that really honest really open um, and what we realized actually is that we're out of survival mode now and we need to, um, we're going to keep the frequency because people love those company wide updates every two weeks. So that's like the top thing that came out in the stay survey, but we actually need to shift it back to, um, a different style of update because we're not in survival mode anymore. You know, everyone's been back from Berlin since October. We're now, you know, back into growth mode and actually having to shift our services a bit. Um, and therefore, we've got to keep the frequency, but, but change the tone almost of those updates. Um, so that's just kind of something that we're that we're going through right now that might be useful for people to hear. So it sounds sounds like in those updates during when you're in survival mode, you were quite transparent about. I mean, as Matt was saying, you know, the, the financial and and survival realities of the of the organisation. Is that something you're going to keep as you go into growth? mode are you gonna are you gonna keep that sort of exposing the guts of the of the business yeah or? i think so because i think we've proven like matt said that people can handle it and they really appreciate it actually um people want more transparency you know people are now saying well maybe uh maybe the pay review process could be more transparent maybe the way that we recruit people could be more transparent you know maybe the way that we choose who goes on what training could be more transparent so um yeah i, I I mean, I kind of, yeah. And, and one of the things that people like is that kind of family feel, you know, we're now kind of 80, 90 people, but we've still got that. And I think part of that is about honesty and transparency. Uh, and some of that's lost in bigger, bigger organizations where there's so many layers, right? That you never really see the reasons for why things are how they are. Hmm. That's, that's really interesting. And I mean, for those of you who don't know Instant Impact, I think we're probably the only ones that we haven't introduced, but we're in-house recruitment specialists. So recruitments are, our main focus and I think 
it's something that we i think capturing those elements like the you know what you're finding in the stay surveys um and then being transparent in turn about that to people who are outside of the business is a really powerful thing you can do for your employer brand as well so really understanding why people work in the organization through data and through through regular surveys is something that will help you to attract new talent into the business and also the right talent into the business right people who are excited about how your business works when they've actually joined makes them more likely to stay for the long run and actually day. felix to loop back on your very first question we're doing the stay surveys without technology as in without a survey so um generally they're face-to-face -face, so we'll we'll um I'll, I'll go to the park with someone near the office and we'll have a chat and it would be so nice old school chat you know on a park bench it's really good um if people are far away then maybe it will be on teams but that's a face-to-face -face survey so it's not it's not done using um an app or anything at the moment and and that's like a good example of where you know when a conversation is, is potentially better we have offered it um, in assistance so we've said look if you if you'd rather not have that as a conversation and you'd rather note down your thoughts or even if you'd rather it was anonymous and we didn't know who was giving that response then you know you could also use um, our happiness index tool to do that um, but you know it's, it's making that balance isn't it and just to, yeah. just to add data your point to, to your point there on the in-house recruitment and so on and so on you know that Billy Ocean song, I think Westlife covered it or whatever, you know, the going get tough, the tough get going. It might have been boys. I get, I get them mixed up sometimes. <laughs> but the, what actually happens is when the, when the going gets boring, people move on. That's, that's what the actual data sh shows. So going back to Becky's point um, about what they're going to do at Varan and keep, keep the umbrella down is that by presenting people these problems, you're actually you're actually open them, open it up to your people to help you fix your problems. So and just to give you a really basic challenge that we had in our company update because that we do weekly, because everyone's working remotely, right? Um, but we do have an office location that we could go into. People have got used to not paying their commuting fares, so we've got people that are saving like five thousand pound a year um, by not having to commute, in, which is massive. And we actually had a, a pitch the other day. So this is a classic example where I was asked in front of everyone, which I don't know the answer to. Someone, someone said, um, if I now, because we had to come in for a pitch, can I claim, uh, can I now claim that on expenses? Because they've got to come in, so it's 70 quid. So they've got used to not paying 5,000 pounds. Now 70 quid is loads of money, isn't it? So they were like, do I explain that? I was like, no idea. What do you think we should do? Because if you live in London, like I cycle in, so if I, if I treat myself as an employee, is that then unfair to me? And so on and so on. So I don't actually know the answer to this question, but now we're gonna, we'll have a little chat about it and we'll work out what our like future of work plan is so that it, so it doesn't like favor certain people over because we've started recruiting people all around the world now in developer roles because we don't care. We don't care if they're based in London or not. Um, so I think, but I think it helps you retain people by giving people the problems to help you come up with solutions because smart and good people want to be involved in, in fixing this stuff. Mm. Absolutely. I can, I'm going to still pretty upset the fact that you're getting Boyzone and Westlife mixed up. But, uh, <laughs> I'm going to do it now. I'm gonna I, think, do it. I think moving uh, to, to move on from that, I think it's, it's really interesting around the, um, you know, the going gets boring people people move on um and i guess that intersection of like technology and honest conversations we got asked by a client um the other day a question that we that i don't know the answer to or i don't know if it's possible but the question was it would really help our business planning to be able to know when employees are going to be moving on to another opportunity or when they're thinking about it um we recognize that we're not the perfect place for everyone to work at every phase in their life how would how would you move to a position where that even that level of conversation isn't a taboo within the organization you could speak to your you know as a formalized process to speak to your manager and say well you know what i, I don't know if i'm learning here or i don't know if i'm being challenged here or i don't know if x y or z so then at, you know at the least your manager can then say well, okay well, i've got two options here i can try and retain gerald um in in the role or i can start helping him to move on to another uh, role where he can develop and i can start planning i don't know whether you guys have any thoughts around encouraging that kind of transparency the other way as well 
before we answer, it was Boyzone, just so everyone knows. <laughs> just Google it. it wasn't Westlife. And I think Google knows that people get this the wrong way around because I thought it was Westlife and it corrected me to Boyzone. Good. Um, Matt, that's a question for you. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a culture thing, isn't it? And we're really lucky that I think we've, we've somehow got that culture. I think it probably comes from the top with us in that we've got two directors who are very open and, and honest and transparent. And where there's no negative consequences if you you know if you did say look i'm i'm struggling and I'm, I'm thinking about looking elsewhere because i can't you know the early warning there's no there's no negative repercussions from that in in brand but i couldn't say more broadly i, I would add something that i learned um, from my granddad which is it's, a, it's an outdated term so my dad was an irish immigrant and they used to have these signs that used to say like basically no irish people need apply um, and my granddad had one of those in his office behind him, even though he's Irish. But the thing that he taught our family is that your job, if you are employing someone, because he was an employer, and this term is slightly outdated now, but it was you have to help that person better themselves. I would update that now to say that if you employ someone or you're a leader or you're a manager, your job is to help them improve. The difficult bit, and this is where I invoke Coronation Street in EastEnders, you know in Coronation Street in EastEnders, and don't pretend people don't watch it because we know we do, is that when something in the real world is happening in Coronation Street in EastEnders, it doesn't really appear in the plot line. And this is how companies think sometimes, like they imagine that they just live in their own world and we have to move ego out of the way here. And I think employees respond, if you, if you can honestly say to your employees that I will help you develop, and the day that I think actually that it's best for you to develop outside this company, I will honestly tell you, because the data that I don't believe is that younger generation want to job hop. Most people who work for me work for maybe six, seven years, and um, because we're all working on a joint plan where we're trying to move forward. And I think if you're honest with people, um, people will stay for five, six, seven years and, and help you grow your business. But there needs to be that thing that, are you going to be honest with them if you think this is the day when actually, um, if Google come calling or Apple come calling, will you honestly say, Felix, actually, I think, you know what, this is an amazing opportunity at Apple, you can't turn it down. Like, and so I, I think there's an ego element that we have to let go, which, the, which we all have, which is our oh, businesses are amazing and they're the best place to work. So we have to burst that little bubble. And I think if you do that and you get over that ego element, I think people will realise that you've got their best interests in and I think you get loyalty back from that. So there's just a bit of a, a story in terms of, of, of how I think we can interpret the data. And Felix, on a practical note, Zoe has just reminded me that it, we are doing that through our state surveys. So that is my top tip because they're working so well for us. We literally ask, have you ever thought about leaving Brown? What made you think about leaving? Why did you stay? Um, and most people are really honest they're like yeah I did you know when that happened it did make me question it or when you know when the pandemic happened I did think should I go to a bigger organization it's given us such good insight into what would make someone look elsewhere and therefore we could do about it fantastic that's really um it's really hard. I love the idea of the stay surveys I, I, I really do um and also uh, absolutely when you're opening up and I guess being vi being vulnerable as an organization or as a leader, then you open up those conversations and create the space for, for that dialogue. I have a, I have a confession to make, which is that I haven't been paying attention to the Q and A box, um, which I've now <laughs> got up in the last 10 minutes. So apologies, apologies to the three questions on there. Uh, most recent first then, um, if I could ask, and, I, and Matt, I'm going to come to you. And I think it's uh, uh, maybe a, a really interesting one is, is, do you see areas where tech can be detrimental to business culture? Yeah, all, all the time. And I'd include my technology in that. Um, if you think that your this technology is going to replace what you need to be doing, which is sitting down with people virtually or normally and listening to them, then then you you just on the total route. So it goes back to the, it goes back to the original part that you've got to be working out like how are you trying to create a thriving culture. And how will technology support that? So if you think of the happiness index, that's going to give you live data on how people are feeling and thinking and how engaged they are and so on and so on. If you become, if you, you, you need to use that to help you. But if that means you stop like having a coffee, virtual coffee or real coffee with your team and asking them how they are, <laughs> then you've, you've totally missed the point. Um, and I apply this to all technology. Um, email's the worst, isn't it? Uh, 
now I go into the office now on a Tuesday to have a couple of leadership meetings and I have, and again, it's the dopamine telling me to check my email and social media. I have to tell myself to leave my frigging phone alone because all these engineers at people like Facebook and Google, they have learned how our brain works. So we all have that tendency to check the phone, check the phone, check the phone. Whereas you've got your actual people physically there with you. So it should not replace the normal human stuff that we should be doing, leadership, management, inspiring people and so on. It should be there to support us. Google Maps is a great example, isn't it? Google Maps is a great thing that's helped, that is to there to help us support us on a journey, but it's not going to help us drive better and so on and so on. So I'll call out my own company and every technology provider on that, that you've still got to be a decent human being leading your business. Absolutely. And I guess, so another, I think the first question that came in was around collaboration and, and use of technology in that. How, do, how, how can we collaborate better using technology i think presumably the, the answer there is is the same which is you know use technology to facilitate the collaboration not to replace the you know your your meetings where you get around a table and have that sort of or virtual table and have that human element to it what, what do you think about um uh, that question around collaboration and tech becky i was actually going to just comment on the last one which is that i've seen this um i've seen this trend which is, you probably remember a year or so ago, whenever it was, people were really into predictive analytics in HR. So it was like all the rage for a while because um, the HR systems like Workday Success Factors, they're really good at using previous data to predict things in the future, like who's going to leave and all this kind of stuff. And there are also really nice um, graphs, for example, that show you what your opportunities within the business might be. So it will say, based on your position and how long you've been there, we could predict that you might next move into, you know, from a marketing assistant role to a marketing manager role, for example. Um, and I think it's been quite a good thing moving a bit away from that predictive analytics. Also the kind of, we predict this kind of person would be good in your organization. Cause I think it's um, stifling innovation a bit. Um, so that was just kind of back on, back on your question, Felix, about when technology can be detrimental. I think luckily that's, that's actually been reversed a little bit. Um, possibly because of all the algorithms predicting that, you know, the same kinds of people would work in your organisation and therefore you get a very homogenous group. Um, but yeah, I was just thinking that predictive analytics has just kind of, it's dropped off the radar a bit, hasn't it? Yeah. I think I, I, I would link that again to that, the statement of if you can measure it, you can manage it, because that's what people are trying to do with that, with that data, not picking on predictive analytics. And I'll just invoke, I think it was Seth from Greystones, who said right at the beginning of, of this session that the weather's good in Ireland. How I would encourage, the problem is when you create more data, people like to turn it into a target. It's just natural human tendency. I would encourage people to start using data and see it more like a weather report. So for example, if the weather report says it's going to be sunny, you pack sun cream. If it says it's gonna be rainy, you pack your umbrella. And that's what this data is doing. It's, it's information for us to better inform us to lead our businesses the data is not there to tell us what to do and i think that's we've we've there's a reason big technology companies sell us that dream because they want us to buy and spend our money in that um but i think and i say this as a technology owner we we technology companies should not be overstating what this data is for it's there to help you understand not to run your business um and that's where i think that the data driven word needs to change a little bit um, to be around helping you understand not to drive your business it's there to, to make your decision making better yeah. and on collaboration Felix I'm going to be slightly controversial and say that I hate slack and collaboration I can't stand <laughs> it it's just oh my god there's just so much there's so much I don't know if other people on the chat love it or hate it thanks Seth. <laughs> there's just so much it's like That's oh my god you. and I know that my colleague Zoe finds WhatsApp absolutely overwhelming because you know if you go into a meeting for an hour or something you get all these group chats and there's millions of notifications um yeah it's a bit much I actually am quite enjoying email <laughs> still <laughs> email suits me to a T if it's something really important think it over an email SharePoint is also a godsend it's working pretty well for us we're old school I'm uh so I'm, I guess the other extreme. I'm a, I'm a massive chatter. I really don't like email. I really don't like any texting, Slack, or anything like that. If there's something important, I just I, I find it way more efficient to 
to get on the yeah, phone. Yeah, but or because we've got so good at chatting, I think, and, and calls, the, the number of emails, I think, are, are less. Unless there's something like really that has to be sent in an email, um, I think we're, we're getting quite good at that. I do, th- I do think we should call out there is, I do think there's a well being impact with WhatsApp as well. There's, a, there's actually a data issue with WhatsApp, but we even last week we had, we accidentally had, we've had a, like a leadership WhatsApp group and we just decided to shut it down because it's the only place where you might go to check a message from your mum and you'll also see a message from your CEO. And I just, I do think it's so easy to have a leadership WhatsApp group or a team WhatsApp group, but I do think you just need to shut them down. Like it's tough. I'm still in a couple in our company but i think you just have to bite the bullet and fight it whether it's slack or email or whatever that you, that is one boundary where you, you're going to ch- check a message on saturday from your friend and someone has sent something i do think there's a boundary and a well-being issue with whatsapp and i'm, I'm guilty of that myself so I'm trying to clean up my own act on that and it was hacked recently i don't know if anyone else suffered from that it was also hacked recently which is not great Absolutely, and I was. I didn't. I wasn't affected by it, but yeah, it's no longer no longer the only safe. I had panic phone there. calls. Like, don't open my message from WhatsApp. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same. Okay. Um, I think um, I, I just. I actually wanted to add something on the technology and and collaboration. It's a bit of a. It's a bit of a sidestep on it, but it just reminded me of something that we are we do and are looking to improve our capability to do at instant impact, which is using technology to uh, and sort of testing and assessments to better understand not just people that we want to bring into one of our clients organizations or into one of our own organizations but also to understand uh, the makeup of skills and uh, behaviors and competencies and and wants within um, the business and I think our ultimate um, ultimate vision there is to see um, if if a company wants if a department within a business wants to uh, do something brand new and um, that we'd be able to help them to map the skills required for that against skills already within the business and then also skills not just you know by hiring a marketing exec for example but to look at people with much broader competencies and their ability to do the role um, and I think that that kind of data that you can collect on people can be used to widen um should be used to widen your horizons and um, capabilities rather than to narrow them and, and direct behavior. Um, so I think it's it can be quite a creative element. I think, Felix, the, the word missing, just to add to that, I think is that data, what, what I see it does is it creates empathy. So I, I yeah. like, even if I can't even bother to have another chat about whether it's work from home or, or whatever and what everyone thinks, everyone's got a different opinion. But every, 100% of people want is flexibility, whether you're going back to the office or staying remote or whatever. But when you get data like that, it gives you empathy of what other teams are feeling. Um, and then I think when you've got empathy, collaboration comes. Because suddenly you see it, for, it's like you say that bigger picture. Once you see it from someone else's perspective, you're like, oh, okay, I get that now. Um, and then I think collaboration comes from that. So I think that's what, that, that's what people are seeing. Absolutely. Well, guys, I feel like we could... Um, have this conversation for another hour and a half but alas it's it's coming up to 12 o'clock so I just wanted to finish off by saying Becky Matt thank you so much for joining uh, for what was a really interesting conversation Um, and everyone that joined us today thank you for thank you for joining we've had a lot of questions in um, Becky on your um, uh, on the 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 fortnightly calls and um, uh, and also the, the stay uh, uh, interview so maybe if we could send around a couple of bullet points around that as well so that people can implement that within their yeah, own organizations. Yeah, I'm happy to share the questions that we use um, in case people want to take inspiration from them. They're working that'd be, really well. That'd be fantastic. And then um, we'll also, of course, send um, some details around about um, Varan and Happiness Index um, as, as we go. Uh, but guys, thank you so much. Um, really enjoyable and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Thanks for having you. us, Felix. Bye. Bye.